A bond between two childhood friends is equivalent to the bond shared between two brothers. Nothing can get in between the two. Like every real relationship, there will always be a few rifts here and there, but it's common to experience such a thing. It's what makes the bloodline between the two recipients thicker, hence the term BFFs, or brotherhood in my case. I had a close friend named Joel who I'd known since childhood. We grew up together in the downtown region of our city, where we were not only classmates, but neighbors as well. Well, not exactly neighbors. I lived in a house while Joel lived in an apartment located about five minutes down the street. Joel and I basically accompanied each other for the latter part of elementary school. As we got older and started attending high school, our bond remained the same if not stronger. We would literally do everything together. We made sure we enrolled in the same classes and hung out during our lunch breaks. Joel would always swing by my place after school, either to hang out or work on our school assignments together. My parents treated him as if he was one of their own. It was almost as if he was an unofficial addition to our family. My hamster even liked him, as he would always feed her and play with her. If I had to describe Joel, I would say he was a skinny nerdy kid who had a warm heart but also a fast metabolism. Every time my mother would fix us a plate of dinner, Joel would literally devour it in a matter of seconds. It was almost as if he had some sort of tapeworm in his stomach. I always knew Joel came from a struggling family, as he had once disclosed to me that they'd been living off welfare and disability checks. In essence, I couldn't help but feel some sort of sympathy towards him, which is why I didn't mind if he came over to eat often. There was this one time during one of our summer breaks, though, where things took a darker turn for the worst. I invited Joel to a family barbecue that my parents were hosting on a Saturday afternoon. Joel and I had planned for him to sleep over at my place for the duration of the weekend. My parents had recently purchased an Xbox console with the newest Halo, so we were both anticipating on playing the game later that night. I recall my dad grilling a few chicken breasts on the barbecue while Joel and I played cards on the backyard table. Seeing and smelling the smoked charred chicken really made both of our appetites increase the longer we waited. I could visibly see Joel's mouth begin to water in hunger as a drip of saliva oozed down the side of his mouth. I noticed his hands beginning to tremble while holding a fork in one hand and a knife in the other. It honestly looked comical, but at the same time disturbing. My dad briefly stepped away to grab more meat from the kitchen when I said to Joel, uh, dude, you alright? Hello? Joel, hello? Feed me. Dude, if you wait a couple more minutes, it should be- Feed me! Feed me more! That's when Joel gets up from the table and begins running towards the barbecue, only to notice my dad had brought the metal tongs with him inside. Where's the tongs? I want to eat now! Dude, my dad has them. Can you please just relax and wait five minutes? No, I want to eat now! That's when Joel grabs a large piece of raw chicken from the bowl on the side and begins chomping down on it vigorously. What, what the hell is wrong with you? Why are you eating the raw chicken? Shut up! It's my tongue, not yours! Joel, why the hell are you eating that? It's not cooked yet! Put it down! You're gonna get salmonella! Joel then spat out the raw chicken he was chewing on and began sobbing profusely ah. while saying, It was Josh! He made me do it! What's the matter with you, Josh? Why would you tell him to do such a thing? What? No, I didn't. He's lying. You're lying. Are you trying to kill me or something? I couldn't believe the words that were coming out of his mouth. He was just flat out lying to my parents and using me as a scapegoat. I honestly didn't know what to say in the heat of the moment, so I ended up swallowing my pride and saying, I'm sorry. It won't happen again. My eyes fill with malice as I stared directly into his eyes. About several minutes later, my dad finally finished grilling the chicken. Joel, myself, and my parents all gathered around the backyard table and finally began eating. I couldn't help but feel resentment towards Joel. The fact that he would lie about me to my parents left a disdain in the air which caused most of the night to have an obscure, awkward silence. Later that night, Joel and I sat on the living room couch while my parents were upstairs in their bedroom. I began watching whatever was on the television as Joel had control of the TV remote. I was still pretty heated from the barbecue and didn't want to acknowledge nor look in his direction. 
About 30 minutes into the movie, Joel awkwardly stares at me and begins smiling like a weirdo. Again, I mean mugged him and drew my attention back towards the TV. Through my peripheral vision, I could tell he was still looking at me, despite not making eye contact. One lesson I grew up following was that you never break the bro code or backstab your friends. It was pretty alarming knowing that he would think I would forgive him so easily. Joel then said in a harsh tone, why aren't you looking at me? I blatantly ignored him and kept my eyes glued to the TV. Hey, why are you ignoring me? Why aren't you answering me? Leave me alone. I thought we were best friends. Best friends don't throw each other under the bus, Joel. You lied to my parents, you piece of shit. I then saw Joel's eyes begin to tear up as he said, I'm sorry, I was just hungry. I didn't want your family to hate me. I just, I just haven't eaten anything for the past few days. I felt sick to my stomach hearing his explanation. I honestly didn't know whether I should feel pity towards him or if I should remain stubborn. I eventually took the high road and forgave him for his actions. For the remainder of the night, we ate leftover chicken from the barbecue and played Xbox in my bedroom. My eyes started becoming heavy as time withered through the night. It was finally time for bed. I turned the TV off and crawled underneath my blanket. Joel snuggled in his sleeping bag and wished me a good night as I wished him one too. About two hours into my sleep, I heard weird noises coming from downstairs. Who could be awake at this time? I glanced at my alarm clock and then looked towards the sleeping bag beside me. My bedroom was pretty dark, so it was hard to see anything. I got up from my bed and briefly turned on the lights, only to see no sign of Joel. My suspicions were right. The person downstairs must be Joel. I immediately turned off the lights and began to quietly head downstairs. As I got to the end of the staircase, I leaned over and glanced towards the kitchen, only to see Joel sitting on the floor with the fridge open. The floor was a mess. Several items from the fridge were scattered everywhere. It was a little alarming seeing him sit there by himself in the dark, so I slowly started walking towards him. The closer I got to Joel, the louder I could hear him chomping down on some food. That's when Joel unexpectedly turns his head and looks back at me. I saw blood dripping from his mouth. I was so terrified to the point where all I wanted to do was cry out for my parents. Joel then stops chewing and shouts, What the hell are you doing here? What the hell are you eating? Joel then lifts the severed body of my pet hamster and says, Feed me more. Ah! Since then, my parents completely shunned Joel from coming over to our house. My family agreed to not press charges considering he was only a kid. What makes the story all the more disturbing is how Joel has since disappeared from the face of the earth. It was reported that he had ran away from home and has since been in a missing persons report. From my family's perspective, we felt as if the backlash from eating our pet hamster and the occurrence of him eating raw meat from our barbecue was enough to drive him away, as he probably didn't want to deal with the noise that might have potentially arisen at school. It was a bittersweet moment seeing my parents kick Joel out of our house that night. It felt like I was losing a brother whom I could never have sleepovers with again. It's been well over two years since his disappearance. No amount of search parties or missing signs could bring Joel back to his home. I beg to differ, as I think Joel finally found the sleepover he so desperately desired. Hey Josh, dinner's ready. Coming mom! What did you make for dinner today, my beautiful mother? Well, in today's menu, we have a large plate of spaghetti with extra meatballs, just the way you like it. Thanks, Mom. Do you mind if I grab a second plate? I'm really, really hungry. Sure thing, kiddo. Knock yourself out. Thank you, Mom. I began to head to my bedroom and cautiously closed the door behind me, making sure the coast was clear and that my parents weren't on to me. I then opened my closet and looked up towards the entrance of the attic while whispering, Hey, Joel, food's here. Feed me more. <laughs> Hungry, aren't you? The 
They say you should only believe what you see. I know what I saw, and I can 100% confirm it. The following events may sound fabricated, or sound like something pulled out of a horror movie, but I can attest to everything being told is factual. I sometimes second-guess myself on the legitimacy of this story, as I ponder if my mind was playing tricks on me, or if I was simply hallucinating that night. But all of those speculations get thrown out of the window, as my friends Paul and Samuel witnessed the same occurrences that I had. It all started when I was patiently waiting for my last class of the day to be over. The day was currently a Friday, so my weekend was just about to get started. I had been waiting for my entire school week to be over, as I had anticipated going to my friend Paul's house. My friend Paul invited myself and our other friend Samuel over for a sleepover. We planned to stay for a duration of two days, which meant we were going to head home on the Sunday. Samuel and I made sure to pack our sleeping bags and leave it in our respective lockers, just so we could head straight to Paul's house right after school was done. After an hour more of my professor's repetitious lecture, the bell finally rang. Classes were done and it was time to start the weekend. Paul lived about 20 minutes away by public transit. Seeing as Samuel and I had brought our sleeping bags to school, Paul decided to ring his dad to give us a lift there. While on our way there, Paul, Samuel, and even Paul's dad began conversing while my attention span for such conversation was at an all-time low. It was almost as if I had a sudden urge to not attend the sleepover anymore, despite being excited for it all week. I couldn't help but feel a weird sensation in my stomach, so I shouted, Hey guys, can you please pull over? I feel really sick. Dude, are you okay? <laughs> I think he's gonna crap his pants. What's going on, son? Do you really need me to pull over? Yes, pull over! Paul's dad pulls over to the side of the road. I immediately hopped out of the car and began running towards the forest area where the entire landscape was secluded with extremely tall trees. I then stood behind one of the trees while trying to remain hidden from the road's view as I crouched down to do a number two. As I was having a bowel movement, I could tell that it was going to be diarrhea. Nothing could be more embarrassing than a scenario like this. I could have sworn I just had a bologna sandwich. Why the hell do I have to go so bad? Usually, I could withstand the smell of my own manure, but then I realized the stench was far greater than that. I remember seeing a dead rabbit laying in front of me. The amount of flies and maggots surrounding its anatomy was appalling, but it was too late to change locations now. As I finally finished my business, I realized that I didn't have any toilet paper. I decided to grab a handful of leaves nearby and figured it was good enough to do the job. Why in the hell do I have to crap my pants out of all days? I really hope this doesn't have poison ivy. As I went to go wipe myself with the leaves, I took a quick glance at the mess I made, only to see no sign of a bowel movement. The only thing I saw was blood splattered everywhere. I was completely puzzled at the notion that I was literally pooping blood, considering I was a pretty healthy guy. I swiftly cleaned myself up and headed back to the car. Everything good, son? Yeah, everything's fine. Are you sure? Yeah, positive. Let's make sure we don't order McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> Several minutes later, we finally arrived at Paul's house. To be honest, the house looked old and ragged, as if the house was built back in the 1900s. I could even see webs and mold growing on the side of the house. It looked like it hadn't been kept in years. I was a little taken back considering this was my first time going to Paul's place. Nonetheless, I shrugged off the notion and carried on to his place. Throughout the night, we ordered pizza and watched a few episodes of our favorite anime. At the time, we were huge fans of Dragon Ball Z, so we stayed up pretty late to binge watch as much episodes as we could before calling it a night. When 12 a.m. came around the corner, Samuel and I grabbed our sleeping bags from the living room and brought it into Paul's bedroom. We then saw a red tent set up on the floor with an illuminated light on the inside. Samuel looked at me and said, Hmm? Pretty cool, eh? Uh, yeah. I guess he wants us to sleep in there with our sleeping bags, right? Probably. Hey guys, you like the setup? Yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm guessing you want us to sleep in there? Guys, go inside the tent. 
I want to show you something cool. Samuel and I made our way inside the tent as Paul turns off the bedroom light, leaving the lamp in the tent as the only light source of the room. Paul then crawls into the tent and puts his hand in front of the lamp while slowly making hand shadows on the wall. I remember Paul making a butterfly shadow and then asking Samuel and I to try it ourselves. I didn't see any harm in it, so I volunteered by switching places with Paul. I placed both of my hands in front of the lamp and attempted to make a shadow of a dog. Here's when the story gets a little bizarre. When it was Samuel's turn to make a shadow, he began adjusting his hands to create a rabbit. If I had to be honest, I definitely felt it as if his shadow was the best among the three of us. After showcasing his rabbit for about 10 seconds or so, Samuel crawls back towards Paul and I. My eyes began to widen, and my jaw completely dropped in awe as I literally couldn't believe what I was seeing. The shadow of the rabbit miraculously remained fixed on the wall, almost like Samuel didn't move from his initial spot. I had to convince myself that it was a prank that was being orchestrated against me. But then I looked across my shoulder, only to see Paul and Samuel in just as much shock as I was. Dude, how the hell is that rabbit still there? I don't know. What the hell is going on, dude? About five seconds later, the shadow of the rabbit begins to dart across the room, creating a loud thud. Dude, this better not be a prank. I, I swear, I, I didn't do anything. Is your house freaking haunted or something? No. At least, I don't think it is. Guys, let's just call it a night. I'm sure it was just our imagination. I I'm freaking heading to bed. Paul and I get out of the tent and head to our respective beds. He crawled into his bed while I slept on the floor in my sleeping bag, leaving Samuel alone in the tent. Samuel then closes the lamp and zips up his tent, wishing everyone a good night. An awkward silence then filled the room, as each person laid quietly. I knew for a fact that Paul and Samuel were definitely not sleeping, especially after what transpired. A couple of hours had passed and I finally induced myself to sleep. A spine-tingling chill grazed past my body and forced me to awaken from my slumber. Michael. 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 I could then hear Samuel's voice calling my name from a distance. It sounded like it was coming from downstairs. I went to go check the tent to see if Samuel was there, only to see no sign of him. I got up and headed outside and saw a bunny hopping down the flight of stairs. What the hell is going on? Am I seeing things again? As I walked further down the stairs and followed the bunny, the voice of Samuel grew louder and louder. Michael! 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 I could then see the bunny sporadically dart to the basement. I decided to follow the bunny as I realized Samuel's voice was coming from down there. I blindly walked down those flight of stairs, despite the entire household being pitch black. When I finally got to the basement, I could see the same red tent from the bedroom being illuminated with a lamp inside. I could hear Samuel in the tent repeating my name. Michael. 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 I then approached the tent and zipped it open only to see Samuel's rotting corpse being chewed on by several rabbits. I could see blood spewing everywhere, with hundreds of flies and maggots surrounding his anatomy. The room turned completely dark as I dropped to the floor and passed out cold. The next morning, my friends Paul and Samuel wake me up from my sleep. I had awoken while laying on the ground of the basement floor. There was no sign of a tent, nor was there any vital sign of Samuel being deceased. The only logical explanation that I could think of was that I must have been sleepwalking. My friends told me they found me laying on the basement floor, and they found me missing from the sleeping bag in the bedroom. What makes this story more disturbing is how they attested to seeing the shadow of the rabbit that very same night. I still can't comprehend if what I saw that night was just a hallucination or a really bizarre, lucid dream. I was in sixth grade when I met Edmund. He started at my high school in the middle of the term. Edmund hardly spoke to anyone, 
until one day we sat together in geography class. The more we communicated, the more I realized that he wasn't shy. He was very friendly. He told me his parents moved to this town to stay with his grandma, whom he just met for the first time. But whenever he spoke about his grandma, I could see sorrow lurking in his eyes. I liked being friends with him. The way he dressed up and carried himself was enough to circle him out as the rich kid in town. Edmund wore new clothes almost every day, and his dad came to pick him up in a Mercedes. Soon, we started to hang out after school. Ed came to my house almost every weekend, and we played the entire day. Ed mentioned a new video game that his father just bought, and secretly I was hoping to get an invite to play it together. My wish was fulfilled immediately as Ed took me to his house after school. Ed's father wasn't a very chatty person. The entire ride, he didn't even address me once, which felt a bit off-putting. As we got close to his house, my eyes widened from shock. Knowing how excessively rich these people are, I was expecting a big mansion, but instead, it was a two-story normal wooden house. I then recalled that they were staying with his grandma, so it made more sense. Ed rang the doorbell and his mom opened the door with a smile. But as soon as she saw me, that smile faded away. Ed introduced me and his mother gave a fake cold smile, saying, You two go play in Ed's room. I'll bring you some juice. And walked away with Ed's father. It was very clear that none of them were happy to see me. Maybe it's because I'm not another rich kid. I shrugged it off and went upstairs with Ed. A narrow corridor lied upstairs with doors to separate rooms. The first door led to Ed's room. It was a moderate-sized bedroom with a bunch of toys and superhero decorations that were recently put up. We sat near his computer and started playing. Ed's mom brought us juice and crackers. After playing for almost half an hour, I felt the urge to pee. Ed told me the washroom was down the hall. I walked through the corridor and was about to enter the washroom when suddenly something caught my eye at the end of the hall. There was a room at the end of the corridor which I didn't notice at first due to the dim lights. I could hear whispers coming from that room. I was trying to listen in on what was being said, but then the door swung wide open. Ed's mom came out, and our eyes met. She immediately closed the door behind her, but in that small moment, I saw a glimpse of an old woman lying on a bed with an oxygen mask placed on her face. Ed's mother looked at me with wide eyes and said, Your parents must be worried. Ed's dad can drop you off now. She walked away to tell Ed that it was time for his uninvited guest to go home. I was just a kid, but I didn't fail to read between the lines. After another silent ride with Ed's dad, he dropped me off at my house. I felt very insulted. I promised myself to never go to Ed's house ever again. I had no idea that rich people could be this mean. Time went by and I started avoiding Ed at school as well. He understood that I was pissed off with his parents' behavior, so one day he confronted me during recess. Look, I know they were rude. My grandma's health always has them on edge. What happened to your grandma? The day we arrived, we dropped mom at the house and went to buy gifts for grandma. I mean, I was meeting her for the first time. All these years, my parents didn't even mention her. Dad says Grandma got mad at him because he married my mom. So, we thought that a little alone time with Grandma would help Mom to reconnect with her. But, when we reached home, we found Grandma lying on her bed unconscious. She was in a coma for a long time and no one even knew. Then why don't you guys take her to the hospital? Because sometimes she wakes up on her own. Also, my mom is taking good care of her. She'll get better soon. I felt bad for judging his parents too fast. I had no idea about their struggles. We sorted things out and became friends again. Ed came to my house that weekend. We were playing in our backyard when he said, Hey, why don't you come to my house for a sleepover tonight? My parents are going out of town for some work. They won't be home until tomorrow evening. Even though I swore not to go to his house ever again, I couldn't stop myself. What about your grandma? Won't she be angry? Come on, she doesn't even leave our room. We can play video games all night. I told my parents about this plan and I lied to them, saying Ed's parents had invited me. My mom knew Ed well already, so she didn't say no. I packed a small bag and we rode our bikes to his house. Ed had a nicer bike than I did. 
there was an electrical bell attached to it. We played in his backyard for an hour, and as the sun set, we went back inside. Let's eat something. Ed ran to the kitchen and I followed him. There were lots of cardboard boxes scattered around the kitchen floor. It's been quite a long time since they moved here, but it seemed like they still had a lot to unpack. Ed stood in front of a big shiny freezer that appeared to be brand new. He opened it and I found myself standing in a world of Willy Wonka. I mean, not just chocolates. The freezer was brimming with food and drinks. I grabbed as many tasty treats as I could and shoved them in my mouth. After converting our stomachs into big fat bellies, we went back to his room and spent the rest of the night playing video games. I was having a great time, no doubt. We played level after level like crazy, and we had no homework or parents to tell us to go to bed. Hours passed by when the clock in his room struck nine. An alarm started to go off, creating an annoying electronic sound. Why did you set the alarm for 9 p.m.? Oh, I almost forgot. It's time to feed Grandma. Uh, can you go? What? Me? I don't even know her. Doesn't matter. She'll be asleep anyway. You just have to put the food tray near her bed and come back. Ed pestered me to do this, saying he's in the middle of the level. I had to agree because it was my turn after him. Ed showed me the food tray that he kept on his desk. The entire house was dead silent. I stood in front of the narrow corridor with the food tray in my hands. An uncanny feeling started to churn inside of me. I slowly walked to her door. Every time I took a step, the wooden floor creaked in a spooky way. I twisted the doorknob quietly and stepped in. The gloomy red light of the room creeped me out. A smell of weird chemicals triggered my nostrils like an electric shock. There was a worn out couch, a wooden table filled with lots of medical supplies, and a bed on the right corner of the room. I've already seen that bed, and also the frail old woman lying on it. The beeping of the ECG monitor mixed with the heavy breathing of Ed's grandmother gave me a feeling that I'm not supposed to be here. I noticed the stand next to her bed and tiptoed to drop off the food tray. My eyes widened as I took a close look at her face. Her eyes were closed and her breath was creating vapor inside the oxygen mask. The smell of chemicals was even stronger near her. I put down the tray and turned to walk out when my hand accidentally hit a candle stand and it fell on the floor creating a loud thud. I immediately picked it up and my eyes went over to the bed again. And this time, she was awake. Ed's grandmother was staring at me with wide, scary eyes. Her bony body trembled and an inaudible sound came out from her mouth. I I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to wake you up. Ed told me to bring you food. What happened next happened so quickly that I still struggle to recall the memory. She got up on her bed and pulled off the oxygen mask in one go. She then grabbed my hand and pulled me right next to her face. She opened her mouth and, oh my god, her mouth. There was no tongue in her mouth. Someone chopped off her tongue, making the bloody, rotten flesh gush out. She grabbed my neck and started to choke me like a maniac. I was sweating like a dog and gagging at the same time. There was no way I could free myself from her tight grasp. Just then, the room door opened and Ed entered. He rushed to me and started screaming at his grandma while trying to free me. Grandma, why are you hurting my friend? Let him go! He pulled me away and I fell on the floor panting for air. He walked to her and said, Mom and Dad will be home soon. You better finish your dinner and go to bed like before. You're sick. You need rest. As Ed went on screaming at her, I saw the burning hatred rising in her eyeballs. She grabbed Ed by his neck and bit off a chunk of flesh from his cheek. He screamed in pain and I screamed in horror. I pulled him away and we ran out of the room with our lives in our hands. Ed never expected his grandma to act this way. We rushed into his room and locked the door. We dialed 911 without wasting a single second. Abrupt footsteps were running around the corridor and suddenly stopped near our door. Ed screamed. Grandma, what is wrong with you? Just then, we heard loud bangs on our door. His grandma was going insane. 
She was not only thumping the wooden door with her fists, she was kicking it like a mad woman. When the cops arrived and took her into custody, the entire incident unfolded in an unexpected way. That tongueless crazy woman was neither crazy nor Ed's grandmother. Yes, she was the actual owner of that house, who was living on her own until Ed's parents illegally barged in. And Ed's parents? They were bank robbers on the run for the last five months. They made an evil plan to take shelter in this old lady's house. Everything they owned or bought was with stolen money. While Ed was busy buying gifts for his grandma, which I believe was also part of their plan, Ed's mother cut off the poor woman's tongue so that she couldn't scream for help. Not just that, Ed's father gave her sedatives every day to keep her unconscious. When the old woman saw me and Ed, she took us as threats and acted in self-defense. Ed's parents were sent to prison with serious criminal charges, whereas Edmund was transferred to a foster home. I still remember the day I saw him for the last time. He hugged me with tearful eyes and said, I never had a grandma. And now, I don't even have parents. <laughs>